Okay, it's seven. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, before I introduce very briefly Hugh this evening, I want to make the same comment I made a little earlier about the format. Hugh's going to open with a few slides that kind of describe uh, his background and the organization that he works for, the Noble Research Institute. And then we're going to talk about a selection of topics that cover the subject of regenerative ranching. And Hugh is going to talk about the view from the Research Institute. And then we're gonna pause and let you guys ask questions. And if you would, when a question occurs to you, go ahead and put it in the chat. And that way, when we hit a pause, we'll be able to take them roughly in the order that you put them in. And uh, our intention is really to make this evening a discussion and not just a one-sided, this is view from the top down. So let me paragraph here that I think is the summary level introduction to Hugh. And it says that Hugh Aljo serves as the director of ranches, outreach, and partnership for the Noble Research Institute. In this role, he oversees the 13,500 acres of Noble ranches, as well as outreach and partnership efforts with allied industries and organizations. He also serves as a subject matter expert in the areas of pasture and range stewardship and adaptive grazing management. Hugh joined Noble Research Institute in 1965. And Hugh, with that, um, I can make you the speaker, I think, make you a host, and you can share your slides from there. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I've been here since 19. 95. So there might have been a typo on, on, on the introduction instead of 60. What did I say? 65. I, uh, 65. Oh, uh, yes. I well, was, uh, uh, there, there, if there were typo, it was here. It's 95. <laughs> well, can you see my screen right there? Let me see if I can. I, I don't see your screen. Okay. I don't see it yet. Well. Some reason. Let's see what what button do I need to hit there, Susan? Can you? Well, Kate, if, do you know if it's set up for others to share the screen besides NPAT? Um, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure because um, Michelle set it up. Okay. But I think if oh, I there we go. Some, there we there go. There it is. See it. Okay. All right. Well, I'm making progress here. It's, you know, technology is not always my best friend, but we'll go ahead and get started with that. Uh, I just wanted to get started with just a little bit about Noble Research Institute, tell you a little bit about me. And even though uh, 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 Kate's already got me, got me introduced, I'll tell you a little bit more about what, what I do here at Noble. Uh, um, Hugh, yes, um, can you go ahead and start your PowerPoint at the bottom? There we go. Presentation mode. There you go. All right. Perfect. Can you see it? See the full thing there? Yes. Okay. Got it. So, just a little bit about uh, Noble is that uh, we've had, we had a unique founder that he was kind of a, a he was a person that that was a, a visionary probably long before his time. You know, he had this quote, and he's, we've got several of these from his writings and his lectures that he did throughout. Uh, the course of time that says the land must continue to provide for our food and clothing and shelter long after the oil is gone. So he was an old man, but he had a brief start here in the Ardmore area working with farmers and ranchers because his, you know, his dad had a hardware store. And whenever the people, after a lot of the areas had played out, couldn't no longer pay their bills, they would hand in their deeds to their land in order to uh, suffice the payment. Well, of course, you know, come about the early 1920s, there was the a big oil boom there in this part of the country. They were land rich and now they had land that had oil underneath it. Well, Lloyd Noble decided he wanted to get into the oil business and his, even though his, his dad had passed away, he asked his mother, 
for $85,000 for, for a loan. Now, he had already just dropped out of, uh, out of uh, college, was going to go, wanted to be, become a wildcatter, but his mother knew what he was made of and decided to go ahead and give him the loan. So they gave him a loan of $85,000. That's like asking, uh, you know, your 20, 21 year old uh, college dropout uh, son that might come to you asking for about $200,000 in today's money. And she gave it to him. And he went on. Uh, this is his first rig in 1921, his, his old company. And he was immediately successful. He believed in technology. He believed in investing in the people and the land. And the most important, he, he believed in taking care of the people that were taking care of him. Most of them were farmers and ranchers. The reason why they were working in the oil field is they couldn't maintain the lands themselves without that extra income. Well, during that period of time of growing up, he also saw the Dust Bowl. We're all familiar with what, what occurred during that period of time. He, he decided since he was fortunate to, to uh, have the money that, that had come in through the land itself, he wanted to give back to the land. So in 1945, he started the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation, naming the foundation after his dad, who he said was the most generous man he had ever known. And that was our beginnings. So just a little, little bitty office, downtown Ardmore, and then we began to grow. We started making recommendations based off of research that we had done on improving the soils. That was where his passion was. How do we improve the land? Because as he had flown across the, uh, the, the different, to different oil fields, he saw the erosion that took place of a lot of these lands that should never have been broken to the plow eroding away. He wanted to, 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 to help uh, reclaim a lot of that land. He wanted to re revitalize, improve, uh, re, uh, reinvigorate the land, as he would say. So we started doing some research, trying to find ways to, to take care of some of these lands that were plowed in particular, develop a consultation effort. And 77 years later, we kind of look like this on our campus. And this is when in 2017, we, did, we developed what we call the Noble Research Institute. What it is is just a subsidiary of the Noble Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation, but allows that our, our operating activities stay within the Noble Research Institute. And then the Noble Foundation is the granting body uh, for funding that can be used to, you know, directly for the Noble Research Institute and for other philanthropic causes. So they've just made that, that distinction in 2017. Well, in 2019, <clears throat> we had a new president uh, take, take the, the helm here at Noble. And the board were beginning to ask questions as to what is it that we really want to spend our time and effort? Because we've been doing plant breeding, we've been doing plant biology research, and we also have been doing work with farmers and ranchers here in the Southern Great Plains. And what they decided to do, the board themselves, which are our noble children, or grandchildren and great-grandchildren now, uh, they, really take their, the, you know, the founder's original intent seriously. They could study on it. And what they, with our new president, got uh, put together an outside advisory board, and they made this recommendation in 2019. And it was sort of based off of uh, the book of Jim Collins, you know, Good to Great. You know, what's the one thing that you can be the best in the world at? What's your BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal? And they said, based off of all the observations, and these were people across the United States that uh, through plant science, through uh, agriculture, through livestock breeding, uh, livestock programs, they came back in here and just said, you know, this is what Noble's best suited to do is land stewardship for improved soil health and grazing animal production with lasting profitability. And so we began to change our direction. We shut down our breeding programs, our plant biology programs, and decided that if we're gonna do research, it's gonna be at landscape scale because we wanted to take care of the land first because that's what Lloyd Noble wanted. And, and, and you, know, you people that, that uh, those of us that can really appreciate uh, you know, native prairies and we can, uh, we can understand what the meaning of the soil is. You know, if, we, if any of you have taken a soils class you know, for years, what have we talked about? The physical and the chemical attributes of the soil and how do we enhance production based off that? But there's one other element that's critically important. The only thing that makes it alive is the biology. And there hadn't been a whole lot of, of understanding nor science that was built around the biology. And now over the past decade, there has been 
uh, much more research has been uh, uh, conducted. And now we're beginning to understand what that complementary effect of biology is and just how important it is. So that's where we wanted to, sh to, to shift our focus. So what we've done is take this, this focus and call it regenerative ranching. That's our term. Yeah, you know, there's nothing magic about it. It's just what resonates with us because our founder wanted to rejuvenate, regenerate the land. And then we created our own definition. And this is how we define it. It's just a process of restoring degraded grazing lands using practices based on ecological principles. We want to get back to nature. We would love to be able to turn a lot of these lands that were broken to the plow and planted to uh, other crops, forage crops, back to something that's more, you know, should be more like a native prairie. Now, we can, will we return it all back to a native prairie? Maybe not, but that's what our objective is, is to manage it such that through the ecological principles that we can restore more of the native prairie and the conditions as such that we would have resembled prior to us as, as you know, the European civilizations breaking ground. So that's where I go. Our, our, our practices uh, are based around these six principles of soil health, you know, knowing your context. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit about what context means to us. Cover the crop, you know, cover the soil, minimize soil disturbance, maintain continuous living plants, increase diversity and integrate livestock. That's what our native prairies, you know, would have done. And it wouldn't have been livestock, but it would have been the nature, the natural uh, uh, animals that, that moved across the plain, the bison, the elk, the deer, the antelope, as well as the, the turkeys, the quail and the other types of wildlife that would have been associated with it. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're using the soil health principles in order to tailor our practices to continue the improvement of the soils. You know, and why grazing lands, this is just a little uh, schematic from Bloomberg, shows the different types of land use. And you can see the pasture and range is a significant portion of our, our, our continental United States. In fact, there's 654 million acres and it's these grazing lands that we're trying to target our efforts around. We feel like this is where what we know best and where we feel like the greatest needs. You know, some of the soil health work that's being done in cropland, there are other entities doing it, but there's not very many that want to focus on the grazing lands and, how, and especially, you know, our, our native prairies. So our mission today, and this is what it'll be for, you know, long after I'm gone here, is the guide is to guide farmers and ranchers in applying regenerative principles that yield healthier soil, more productive grazing land, and business success. We do it through producer guidance. That will be within educational settings. Hopefully, most of it will be applied. In fact, that's our intent, centered around applied peer networking of producers so that we can better understand and appreciate our grazing lands, and in particular, our native range. Also doing one-on-one -on -one type of, of interactions. We're still on, you know, we still feel like there's going to be the need for consultation, co coaching as it's needed for producers that want that one on one interactions with us. And we're going to continue to do research, but it's going to be at a ranch or at least a field scale. This is just some of the instrumentation that we're using here, collecting soil samples to better understand the, the soil health of our soils, not only in the, the top six inches of the six to 12 inches as well, but also going down to you know, a full meter in depth. And we're doing that across all our ranches as we're making this transition, even with our introduced, introduced pasture areas to, to manage them more like native range would be, taking what nature will give us and begin to build back some of the natural uh, uh, plants that would be there. Because we believe, and we're already seeing evidence of it, that the native seed bank is still, you know, it's still, still good. It's still available. Now we might be able to jumpstart it with, you know, with some seed, but we're not going to make any real changes in adding seed to our, to our uh, introduced pastures or cropland areas until we begin to see some of these native plants begin to appear you know, through our, through our management. This is another quote that uh, Lloyd Noble uh, provided to us. No civilization has outlived the usefulness of its souls. When the soil is destroyed, the nation is gone. You know, truly a visionary. You know, he died when he was 54 years of age after the noble Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation had been in, in existence only five years. And it says a lot about the family being uh, responsible to the, to the founder's original intent, going, going, forth and taking the stand that they have 
shutting down significant operations here in order to focus and center around soil health and restoring the, the land, the grazing lands, to something that at least either resembles what should have been here originally or, or would be at, with our native rangeland that we still have in existence. It's about healthy soils and a stronger and stronger bottom line. You know, we understand that producers have got to be able to make a profit in the short term in order to have a long-term future. But if we can't do it by improving the soils, then we're probably not going to be involved in it into the future. To know a little bit more about Noble, this is some of the information that you can look at. Uh, is our website, www.noble.org. We've got several publications in there that talks a little, talks quite a bit about our regenerative ranching activities. Uh, you can sign up to receive a weekly digital newsletter, just noble.org slash backslash subscribe, and you can get that uh, uh, weekly. Uh, there's YouTube videos. Just Google, look up Regenerating the Ranch. Uh, those there are available. And this, then if you do social media, I can't say I do, but there are those that do. Uh, those are some of the, those are some of the, our, 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 uh, social media areas you can pick us up on. And uh, with that, that is a, just a really quick overview of Noble, Noble Research, where we are today. Be happy to, to answer questions. And then I know we've got several uh, questions that uh, Kate has generously been able to outline. So I'm gonna try to shut this down and then be able to turn this back over to y'all. and share I think if you find a button that says stop sharing all right pause stop sharing <clears throat> maybe at the top of your screen there you go there you go, there you go. Yeah, thank you for the instructions okay <laughs> um so do you want to continue on with you've I think you've covered the first few topics that you and I discussed yes, ma'am. Uh, quite nicely. Thank you for those slides. Uh, we could either just have you continue on. There is one question, but it's a, it's very specific. And Suzanne, I'd like to hold that one for a little bit later. Is that OK? We get more. Not a details. problem. OK, no problem. So. Um, how long has regenerative ranching been a thing? Well, regenerative ranching has is, is probably been around a lot longer than what we would have imagined, but we've probably not used that term. If you go back to one of the, some of the true grazing uh, gurus back to Boisin in France back in the 17, 1800s, he was uh, one of the, the, the original gurus that started this, this applied grazing management. But in the United States, it really began to take form when Alan Savory came into the, U the U.S. Uh, there in the late 70s or early 80s uh, with the holistic resource management model. And uh, uh, he stirred up uh, quite, quite a bit of uh, attention. And with, you know, with a lot of the claims that were you know, saying that you could double and triple stocking rates. Well, you know, the rest of the, the context in which you have to work around is if you have the forage to, grow, to, to actually do that. But a lot of people misinterpreted what was being communicated and sort of uh, uh, felt like that it failed them. But the reality of it was the people that went in and stayed consistent with the holistic resource management principles began to truly manage uh, according to the practices and increase their stocking rates as their forage production improved as they provided the rest and recovery to the rangelands and only stocked as they had forage. Uh, next thing you know, I'm going to say the next thing you know, 10, 20, 30 years. I know some of these guys have been doing it 40 years and I've been to their properties and it's a different, complete forage and range sites in many instances is what, than what's right across the fence from the people that, that have never changed their management. And so it really began back with people beginning to manage more holistically, manage the, the entirety as opposed to, to trying to come in and uh, uh, put in new, new grasses, introduce pastures that 
that on a lot of sites weren't well suited to begin with and beginning to learn how to make use of what's already existing, but providing rest and recovery, which a lot of these uh, uh, range rangeland type pastures, native range in particular, weren't receiving much recovery at all. It was, you know, most of our pastures were continuously grazed. And so as we begin to better understand what rotational grazing could do, and then better manage the stocking rate according to actual carrying capacity or the amount of forage that you could really allocate to, you know, for grazing, uh, we begin to see some dramatic changes. And as we begin to test these, and that's what we're doing here with some of the research here at Noble is not only testing our, our sites, but some of these sites that have been in uh, existence in this holistic management for 20, 30 plus years, they have organic matters that are, uh, you know, six, eight, sometimes almost double digits, which is unheard of in this part of the part of the country, when most of the soil samples I look at are near one, two percent at, at best. So you've mentioned uh, soil recovery. What are the other um, principal tools of regenerative management? Well, the, re the tools of regener regenerative management that we really focus on and uh, sometimes people focus too much on is grazing and fire. You know, the, the native prairies, you know, what, what did it, what did it uh, evolve under? Well, grazing and fire. But the reality of it is that's not the whole story. The, the, what really occurred is that we've got these large herds that moved in, you know, across the landscape and they weren't just the bison, and that's, but that's what re receives all the attention. But you had the bison, you know, you had mule deer, white-tailed deer, uh, you, you had antelope, you, oftentimes you had elk. And, you know, they were all moving across the landscape and depending on the region of the country in, together. And you, know, you had these other organisms and as they would, uh, you know, and other wildlife creatures that were with them. But as they moved across these different areas, they wouldn't come back for a long period of time. And they didn't graze it all down to the ground. What they did, they just laid a lot of it over. They just took the best of it and kept moving. So what, what we're trying to do with our, with, the, you know, with our grazing management is provide rest and recovery following a grazing event so that the plants can fully restore itself. But even within the grazing event, we're trying to only take the top part of it, the top third. You know, we say take half, leave half. But really, if we can take less than a half, give more of it to where we can place it back on the soil surface to where other organisms can work upon it, digest it, and begin to incorporate it into the soil, we begin to build the biology much more rapidly. So really the, the keys are, you know, yes, grazing is important, but it's how we graze it. And more, probably more important is the rest and recovery. We've got to leave a lot of residual. We've got to give our lands, you know, especially our native lands, adequate recovery. If you started today and said, I'm going to fence this pasture and subdivide it and move my cattle through, how long would it be before we notice a difference in the pasture? Well, as we talk about noticing the difference, it, before we can measure a difference or can we notice a difference? You know, there's two different things. And what we, if we begin to set up a system and, and let's, let's, let's provide the caveats here, we're not going to overstock it ever. Okay. So we're going to manage our forage production and we're going to allocate just what we can for those periods of time when the animals can be in there only after the plants have been fully recovered. So if we're doing that every time we're moving them in and then giving them a very short grazing period, putting as much on the ground as, as possible, but also taking the quality off of it and then giving adequate recovery until we come back, uh, you can begin to see visible differences within a year or two. But it's, it depends on whether you're doing any type of management at all to begin with. It's the rest, the recovery, and providing the residuals where you begin to see the first evidence. Do we have full, re, you know, full cover across the soil with either plants and or plant residual? And what you'd really like to see is a solid plant canopy, and underneath it, when you dig down in it, you've got a really nice, you know, I say relatively thick, but you'd like to see a lot of plant litter, plant material that's decomposing at the soil surface. That's the initial start. The other okay, thing, and, and the other thing that you can see is go out there and take a shovel. You know, most of us look across the landscape and, or, and look down maybe, and but nobody looks underneath it. You know, and that's what we, we've seen. And I, you know, if you go out there, get you a really good shovel, dig down, pull it up to where you can see what the color of the soil is. 
So if you look at the color of the soil, it should be really dark at the top. And if it's really good, you'll see it dark the entire, the entire profile. But if you're doing good management over a period of time in our rainfall, where we get about 35 inches of rainfall here in our part of the country, we should expect to see that darkening area from the surface down to begin to go you know, deeper into the soil, a half inch to an inch a year. You can, you can track that. And the nice thing to do, if you want to see what it kind of should look like in a, in a short period of time, go outside your fence and between that roadway and your fence line, dig a hole there and take, make a comparison on the same type of soil. Because what happens out there in the roadway? How often does it get harvested? Maybe twice a year. And occasionally you might get a little fire that runs across it you know, accidentally. But all the material does what? It goes back to the surface. It, so look at that, see what the color looks like, what that, that area, that's a, that's a low kind of the first level of, of, of success you'd like to attain. And of course, you can always do your, you need to be doing your soil testing and, you know, and, I, and a Haney test, a soil health test of some kind, just so that you can see what the nutrient load is, both the organic and inorganic. And that's why we like the soil health test because you get the organic component as well. The organic component feeds the biology. It also gives you a, 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 a it's not an indication of, of what exactly the biology is, but it gives you the, uh, an idea of the amount of total biology within the soil based off of a respiration uh, meter. So there's things that we can begin to do to measure it, but if you want to see it early on, those are some of the early things that you can do. Let's take a break here and run through these questions and then we'll go back. And when we go back, help me remember, I want to start with context. Context, yes ma'am. Okay, so the first question is from Suzanne and she asked, what species of legumes do you find most beneficial in rangeland restoration? In a, in a rangeland restoration, if you're wanting to go right back into, you know, the Illinois bundle flower, is one of the best ones that, that we see. It, it's a little larger seeded, so it's a little easier to, to get started. Uh, some of the native medics are, uh, are pretty easy to, to establish. They're, they're, you know, those are the two that, that really come to mind. Uh, there, there are several others, and you'd have to forgive me of the, I'm drawing a blank as to, to which ones that I would, I would recommend. But you know, if, if you go to uh, people like Bamert Seed, uh, Turner Seed Company, some of those that are, have the true native mixes, the what the where the you know the mixes that have the seeds that they have in there that are the legumes, you know these guys know really know what they're doing, and I I would rely on them, especially in your region. Which ones would you include for your area? Do you have a general recommendation for percentage of Forbes versus grass? Forbes versus grass, it, you know I go back to the what I, I look at the web soil survey. You know, if you go to the web soil survey in many parts of the country, I can look under the ecological site descriptions and it'll tell me about what the percentage should be. So it varies between where you're at, uh, but that's the, that's the guideline because it's, it's, all, it's all based off of, uh, you know, some of their, their own, say they're I call them pristine, but they're climax plant community, which is, I know that's not the right terminology anymore, but I still use it because that's what I learned when I was in college. Uh, so, uh, but that's where I start. But in most range you ought to have at least 15, in many places, 20% Forbes and feel good about it. You know, I know it in our part of the country, we're looking for 15 to 20%, uh, especially if there's some of the, uh, the Forbes that are the deeper tap, deep tap rooted ones, we want to see them. Okay. Um, Becky Bertoni asked, and by the way, if you asked a question and you have a follow-up, just take yourself off a of mute and the discussion can go on. But Becky asked, are you using any of the plant research you did previously? What was that plant research? Well, you know, I'm almost embarrassed to say when I'm talking to the Native Prairie Association what our plant research was. But, uh, you know, it was, but it was primarily centered around small grains and some legumes. Uh, you, you know, we, we were not focused on, on, on native, native range. It was uh, kind of the old, you know, the old uh, uh, historical focus around how do you, you know, what, what can we develop a crop out of? It's something that will grow really fast. Uh, Elbon rye, you know, many of y'all heard of it. 
That's just noble spelled backwards. So we're not real creative on our names. So it's the most widely used cover crop in, in the world still. Uh, but that, that's probably the biggest claim to fame that we've got. There's one of the, one of the fescues, again, not native, but it's uh, the Texoma Max Q is one that we did. There's a heavy grazer oat that came out of here that's over in East Texas seed that if, you, you know, but there, they were crops typically, uh, other than the perennial, the Texoma Max Q, we did an alfalfa, but they were all, they were, and then the Durana clover and the Patriot clover, the couple that we, that we put out as well. So I'm sorry to say they weren't native. They were products of the time that we were living in. Well put. Thank um, you. So Mickey also asked about white heath aster. If you have white heath aster, what does that indicate about the soil? You know, I wish I could I could tell you more. The white heath aster, do we have it? Yes. Uh, do we see that it that it uh, you know it's it's not a big uh, a component within the soil. It doesn't produce a whole lot of uh, forage production. But what we typically see is that on these these like heath aster and then some of the other forbs is they typically mine some of the other nutrients such as you know phosphorus in particular, and so they'll concentrate them in the roots and when they decay they make them a lot more available. Uh, those are typically what we're we're finding is that when we see it that's out there depending on the the you know the the stage it's probably an indicator that we probably need a little more rest and recovery on some of our landscapes. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a it's, it's a it's a desirable, but it's usually an indicator that we're probably not quite at the successional stage we'd like to be. If you have very much of it, but to have a little bit out there, yeah, you'd you'd hope you'd have some of it sometimes. Yeah. Okay. The next question. Um, this is from Thomas Betts. Does the Noble Institute still provide on-site consultation services? We yeah yes, we're we're trying to figure out how we're going to do that. We we used to. You know, we did this without fee for years, and we've had some people that, that we had great results with, and we had some people that they'd call up one another farm visit three years later, and I'd ask them, well, what did you do from the plan that we sent you? And they said, you know, I think I received that. <laughs> you'd sit there, and I said, well, I bet it's probably just about as good as it was the day I wrote it, you know. Uh but long story short, you know, what we wanted to do is we, we wanted to be sure that people had buy-in and were committed. And what we're doing is we're restructuring our, our, our activities here. We're going to center around education because we can go national, nationally having a, a bigger uh, uh, effect by teaching and instruction than we can by one-on-one -on -one service. Now, if people want the one-on-one, -on -one, it'll be available for those that that uh, have attended our, our education and it would be, and it will be for a fee. Now we haven't decided what that's gonna be, but that's about to get started. You'll, you will st if you get on our website, you'll learn a whole lot more probably in the next 60 days. So your education services, are they provided by the Noble Institute or are you partnering with other entities, colleges, universities, et cetera? We, we are right now we're trying to develop it around what we could do ourselves, but we know we can't we can't deliver it all ourselves. You know, we want to be able to uh, partner with other entities that are like minded and be able to leverage those resources because we you know, we we understand the Southern Great Plains pretty well. But you put us up in the northern plains or you put us over into the, the, the far western states would be better served to partner with entities that know those areas back to your context. They, they know it much, much better than what we would. The principles apply anywhere. The practices will be different relative to your context. And so that's what we're trying to do. And right now we are partnering, uh, well, we've partnered with, with uh, Ranching for Profit at Dallas Mount, you know, trying to help develop our, uh, why do we want to reinvent vent the wheel of what's probably the best delivery of that type of uh, information. So we've partnered with them. We're going to use elements of that within our, our profitability uh, part of our core. We'll have three cores, profitability, grazing management. We're teaming up with Jim Garish of uh, management intensive grazing and, and uh, you know, all the, you know, the grazing workshops that we know around the country. He's probably the father, the father of most of that. You know, we, we've all tried to copy him. And then we're then on the soil health uh, is going to be the other core. And with that, we're going to be, you know, we've worked with uh, Understanding Ag to some degree 
Uh, we, we continue to look at holistic resource management and, and savory is also people that can help us in all of this. But uh, uh, that's 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 where we're all going to center around us around those areas, but partner with the ent entities that can help us as, as okay. well. So Suzanne asks, do you know of any resources that outline the successional phases and plant communities of a grassland? Sorry, my screen disappeared. <laughs> of a grassland that that a grassland passes through during recovery. Yeah, yeah. well, the, the the NRCS has done a really good job, and most of it's a lot of it's been documented within the Web Soil Survey. If you look under the ecological site descriptions, they talk about the state and transition for the different range and, and ecological sites, and that's the best place to to go to it. And it's not all research, but what it is is based on you know years and years of observations of people in the field. And where what does it look like as you begin to move from one phase to the next? So depending on where you're at, those state and transition models work really well to help us indicate what's it gonna to take to get to that next level. So Becky asks a question, please describe how you get the plants back on the land before grazing. We get the plants back on the land before grazing. And so you have an overgrazed pasture to start with. Okay, how you've got to, the first thing to, you know, the first thing you can do is just let it rest the whole growing season. And that's, you know, a lot of people don't wanna do that. But I have seen more range improvement, pasture improvement occur by just not grazing it. You know, if, you've, if we've overgrazed it for years, it's not going to recover overnight. It's going to take years. But the first step is you got to have something to work with. And the best way to give something to work with is let it just have a full growing season rest and then only utilize what's there and only the percent that you really need to utilize. Never take more. And then you just continue to build off of that the next year. Uh, so several places that have been really overgrazed, let it grow during the growing season, graze it during the dormant season, but leave a lot of residual and repeat that about three years. Then come back in and begin to your, your, your what I call more intensive management rest rotations during the growing season. So Hugh, does that work? Even if we're talking about a, let's say improved grass pasture that you've uh, allowed to become damaged? Yeah, even on the improved pasture, you can probably get it probably can bounce back faster if you want the improved pasture back. You know, that's the, that's, that's the thing. You know, if, if you want improved, and I don't like using the word improved, I use introduced, but, it, but on that introduced pasture, you know, the neat thing about the introduced pasture, but sometime in fortune, is that if you want to jumpstart it, you, 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 let me just back up. Okay. All right. All, most of these introduced pastures, we have robbed the soil of phosphorus and potassium for years. You know, because fertilizer got so expensive, we only put out the nitrogen. And in doing so, we never put back what we were taking. If you're low in phosphorus and, and or potassium, if you're low in pH, you know, lime, that's your best money spent. Let's get the soil to where it can do something for you before you add more nitrogen. Get that up and going and then allow the rest in recovery. But if, it's, if you're low, really, really low in some of those you know, critical nutrients, it takes a long, long time to build it back. So, you know, get, you know, don't be afraid. And people ask me, so, well, you, you know, you, if you, is that regenerative if you do this? Yeah, you talk, you're only talking about starter. You start it, jump start it, get it, and then get off of it. That's what we really want to try to do is not use it as a crutch, but get us started to where the biology begins to work for itself. But you got to have, you got to have, you know, you got to have a little nitrogen in order to grow carbon, because the nitrogen that we would have naturally found in the in the systems come from the die off of the biology in the soil is made available to the plants. The plants pull it, pull that in. They take, you know, the carbon dioxide out of the out of the air, the nutrients and the water from from the from the soil. And then they make more carbon. And so as they begin to build more carbon, we've got to put more of that carbon back so we can begin to, to decompose, feed other organisms so that we can begin that cycling. So that's what we've got to do is just get more forage produced, even if that means we got to do a little bit of fertilizer to get started. Now, so what I think I heard you say is, number one, test the soil, find out what you need. 
Yes. Number two is give the soil what you need, what it needs, sorry. And number three is give it time to use those nutrients before you tax it. Yes, ma'am. Is that correct? That's, that's, that's exactly, and try to minimize the nitrogen. Try to minimize nitrogen. What, what, we're, what we're learning is that, uh, you know, if nitrogen for some reason, we get, when a plant gets excess nitrogen, it, uh, it stresses the plant. It makes it more susceptible to disease, to other organisms like grasshoppers, army worms. You know, in a native range situation, do you ever really notice? I mean, you notice grasshoppers, but you don't see them devastate the pasture very often. But on those introduced pastures, yeah, I mean, you see it regularly. But the pastures like ours, where, where we haven't been fertilizing the last few years, you know, the grasshoppers are there, but ours don't seem to have any problem and the neighbors just having fits. <laughs> Well, I know that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have another another question for you. This is also from Becky. How close is your regenerative agriculture to native prairie restoration? That, that's what we're hoping to achieve. You know, but Becky, it's, it's hard to, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly how you, how you would compare the two. Our native range, we're treating it just like native range. You know, but now we've got areas where we've got brush you know, due to overgrazing before we took possession. And it's come back into a little forest. You know, a lot of these trees, you go out there and they're, they're, they're all 30, 40 years old, you know, dating back to the last really hard times they were grazed. Uh, I can go back and look at the, the pictures of old satellite imagery, and you can see where it was pretty open and now it's not. So we're going in there opening those back up to reclaim them. But what we're doing is then using sheep and, and goats, sheep to eat the forbs, goats to eat the browse, to help keep it and maintain it open to where maybe the and hopefully the native grasses will come in and begin to take over and out compete some of these native areas. And right now the native grasses are coming right back in, but there's still a lot of competition from the woods. So on the native side, that's what we're trying to do. On the introduced pasture, we're taking out the chemicals, uh, we're grazing it, maintaining lots of residual. And what we're looking for, uh, when we know we don't have a lot of diversity and we want more diversity, is we're, we're going ahead and we're interceding some cool season annuals and they're introduced legumes, brassicas of the cropland, trying to build the biology. And once we begin to see the biology as evidenced by some of the desirable native plants begin to appear, then we'll go back and consider adding the native grass seed because now the soils are ready to take them. Otherwise, it's just a waste of money. So um, I, that question was quite specific about jump starting the native plants. Do you want to make a comment here about the viability of the seed bank in a pasture that's been overgrazed for 20 years or so? Well, and what we have seen is that, you know, the seed bank is, 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 is amazingly there. You know, you, you know, what we can do is once we begin to see the, you know, the, the organic matter within the soil begin to build uh, to where we're getting at two to 3% organic matter, we begin to see some of those native plants that you thought were, you know, you know I've talked to producers that have been uh, you know, lived on these ranches their entire lives and never saw them. And all of a sudden here they have Eastern gamma grass or, you know, big blue stem or little blue stem begin to pop up. The seed is typically there, but it has to have the right conditions in the soil in order for them to, 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 to appear. So the seed bank is usually, you know, just latent. It's just sitting there. Now it may be somewhat depleted if it's been a, been a crop, you know, cropland, uh, you know, area for, for, for a long period of time. But, you know, that's what we're trying to do is look at these, these introduced pasture areas, some of which have been pretty good shape. And I can take you to different people that have gone in, they put it, they converted it to uh, uh, Bermuda grass, let's say. And then, you know, somewhere after five or 10 years, they decided, ah, we're just gonna treat it like native and stop fertilizing. And, and within another 10 years, it's half native again. But if it's been there that way for a long period of time where you've, you've really used you know, a lot of chemical fertilizer, it's just gonna take longer. And it's mainly, you know, I believe it's because you, you know, we don't have the organic matter in the soil. And so we don't have the soil biology that to, you know, to, to, for them to really begin to appear. Thank you. That's a great response. So Gene Erickson asks, do you work with other conservation entities such as the Nature Conservancy to share research and experience? Yes, sir. We, we, you know, since we've become wanting to be more of a national uh, entity, uh, 
uh, Rob Manis and Nancy Lobby and, and uh, uh, several of these, these individuals, William Brunnage, uh, they, they are they're people here in the, in the Plains states that, that represent the Nature Conservancy. We're looking at trying to do more activities, more research with them and some of their properties. They're actually wanting regenerative grazing to occur on some of their ranches, but they want it monitored. And that's one of the things that, you know, being Noble Research Institute, we're pretty big into the monitoring piece of it. What is it that they need to monitor? Uh, how do we provide guidelines and a management plan in order to uh, continue to preserve and enhance more so than preserve, but enhance these native these native uh, prairies. So that's, it's, it's interesting, you, you know, you 10 years ago, it's probably not heard of as much, but nowadays, you know, we're, we're, we're at meetings all the time talking about, okay, what's, what can we be doing together? And I think you're going to see a lot more of collaboration between us, the Nature Conservancy and other entities like that over the next uh, five and 10 years. So many of us here in North Texas are familiar with the Dixon Water Foundation. Would yes, you like to tell us about your arrangement with them? Well, the Dixon Water Foundation, I'm on their, I'm on their, their board and on the ranch, I'm the chair of the ranch committee. So I, it's, I'm, I'm blessed to have been asked to be a part of uh, the Dixon Water Foundation. Know Casey Wade really well, who's the new president and CEO. You know, Robert Potts has stepped down. He's still on our, on our committee and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're glad to have it. But the relationship with them is we continue to work with them. They, you know, they've been doing this uh, for, for over 20 years, almost 30 years on some of the, some of the, some of the land. Some of it they've purchased re more recently is, is still coming, coming on board. But the changes that have occurred on that, we can't demonstrate on our properties. So what we do is we refer to the Dixon Water Foundation. They're only an hour and 15 minutes from my office to, to uh, their, their place there, Leo. And so we'll take people down there, we'll take groups. So we'll have uh, uh, activities where the people may visit us, but we want them to go down and see what uh, has occurred down at Dixon Water Foundation and talk with with the entities that operate that. Cause it's a, you know, the holistic resource management is a little bit different uh, management philosophy than, than a lot of the, so some of the regenerative management, but it's not much different. And they have the experiences that you just can't replicate. You just have to go and experience it yourself. Thank you. Um, a question from Morgan Chivers. I've been reading more recently about most earthworms in North America being invasive and that they're disrupting native prairie and forest soil communities. Can you talk more about that and what invertebrates might be better decomposers for native prairies? Well, I, I wish I could tell you tell, tell you more about that. I'm not uh, uh, I'm, I'm not well versed in, in in the earthworms. I can tell you that the you know the big night crawlers that that are uh, we're all familiar with. Most of those are introduced. Now, you know the problem with these big night crawlers compared to the more native earthworms that we have, which are a little you know that are smaller, is that they require a lot more organic matter, a lot more organic material at the surface and they do, they come to the surface and take it and bring it in. There are different videos that you can go out there and find where in a cornfield, they come up there and take a, a leaf of corn and pull it back in. Makes you makes you afraid to go out in the cornfield at night, you know, <clears throat> they're it's just it's pretty amazing. But they, they can consume so light, you know, the positive is they can they can turn over a lot of organic matter. The, 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 the negative is they require a lot of organic matter. So you, you you know it's it's a kind of a double-edged sword. Most places where we see see them, or at least I've been aware of, uh, they've been more benefit than, than a problem. But I have heard in cases where they are just taking so much or you know organic material from the surface, they just can't hardly grow enough and keep the soil covered where they need to. But uh, there probably be other entities that are better to address that question than I am. Thank you, Suzanne asks. Do you ever need to reseed a historically overgrazed pasture if there's not enough recovery after resting? I think you said earlier you did. Yeah, well, you know, to say whether you have to is is, is based on on you know your your value of time. You know, I'm I'm 62. You know, time is pretty precious to me, and it's it's it times money. Uh, I want to see something probably sooner than later. So if I get the evidence that, and I, you know, and I have a good rain site, a very productive rain site, for example, and I see the evidence that uh, it's ready to take 
you know, some of the more desirable, more productive seed, I want to apply it. And I've seen what'll happen on one of our ranches, the coffee ranch, when I first came here 27 years ago, uh, they had seeded some areas to uh, Eastern gamma grass, big blue stem, Indian grass. And I mean, it's a light rake. You know, you're talking seven pounds per acre broadcast. I mean, not a lot. You know, and you know, it was a you know seven or eight eight of your native your your high more high successional native plants, and for three years they didn't see anything, and then all of a sudden, the manager calls up and says, "Man, if I graze this like I've done, I may not ever see this plants again. I think I know what it is, but what is it? Come out here and look at it." So we went out there that spring, and it was eastern gamma grass coming up across the whole pro that whole pasture that we'd seeded. And we said, let's baby it. You know, you got to change your grazing management. As you see those higher successional plants, you got to allow the rest and recovery and your grazing intensity to change. You're no longer grazing it short. You got to graze it tall and you got to have recovery periods that match the, you know, the needs of the plant. And so we said, let's baby this pasture. Let's give it extra rest. Let's just barely nip it. And that first growing season, when I came out there, we doubled the amount of grazing days off that one pasture with a few seeds that, I mean, I, there was a lot of seed that came up, but you know, with the new plants that came in there. And then over the next two years, we tripled it. So it goes to show that once you get a little bit there, if you begin to manage it, it would really respond. And so what we did, we went ahead and we took a couple of other areas to see what would happen. And again, it took two or three years before you really begin to see a much evidence, but through the good grazing management with rest, recovery, managing lots of residual, all of a sudden, you go out there today, those same areas that were producing 4,000 pounds are producing 10,000 pounds of production per acre. That is real. That's how you begin to see the differences. So if you've got a really good rain site, to, you know, go back to Suzanne's question, a really good site, rain site, that's where we put our seeds. That's where you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck. But you want to see evidence that it's ready to take the seed. So Gene Erickson asks, is there a way to control or reduce brome and cheatgrass? <laughs> oh man, I guess the tough ones there. <laughs> brome, cheat, uh, bristle grass, those are some of the nemesis that we have. Uh, typically we find those in, in areas that have been overgrazed. What, what we've seen can work, but you just can't do it all at one time, is we'll go in there and we will we will graze the, the annual grasses hard. And I mean, instead of taking a half, we're going to hit it hard. And then we get off of it the entire growing season. You know, as soon as you begin to, to see and you hit that threshold where the soil temperatures are hitting about 68, 70 degrees, and you see those, those native plants or your, or your warm season grasses beginning to grow, Get off of it and let it go. Now you may have some some you may have a mess of ragweed coming up. Now you got a decision to make there. You know, do you want to just let it go and and just live with it, or do you want to go in there and maybe give it one quick treatment, knowing you're going to treat everything that's out there that's good and bad. But if your canopy is nothing but ragweed, you may want to reduce it with something like 2,4-D really quick. But let's don't, you know, let's do that and let the grass and the remaining forbs grow and let it grow the rest of the growing season. Let's get our let's get the cover. And then you don't have to go back and do it again. That's what we're really trying to do is we're trying to build enough volume there so that we don't have as much competition from the annuals. And until we've until we've got that thatch there of the native grasses there. It's uh, it, it, you're still going to have those annuals. So you may have to do that a year or two on the bromes and stuff before you really have that impact that you want. But the key is that you've got to get the soil covered and have your warm season plants present to shade out anything else later on. If you thought that last question was hard, watch this one. <laughs> it's also <laughs> from Jean, and she says. It must be a challenge for producers to allow a year's rest and other regenerative processes in order to improve their soils and plants. How do they manage this and stay profitable? There you go. That's a good one. Uh, the, the key is you can't do it all at one time. You know, we, 
our human nature is, is we want to go in there and, you know, if we're going to clean house, let's clean the whole dead gum thing. Well, uh, the secret is, you know, you, you know, I, I, I like reading the Old Testament. You look in Leviticus, you know, what is it? It says, give a Sabbath year's rest. What is that? You know, well, one and seven, that's about what, 14, 15%. If you could take and rest through the growing season, 14 or 15% of your pasture, the entire growing season, use it during the, during the dormant season. So you're not really giving it up the entire season. You can begin to make some big improvements in a short period of time. Now, you may have to destock a little bit to get started. Set up a good rotation where you've got the recovery, and then you increase over time as you see your forage production improve. But it's back to going in and saying, I'm only going to take, you know, 80, 80, 80 to 85% of my, my capacity is what I'm going to stock at, and that gives me that extra 15 to 20% as my reserve and the opportunity to provide risk recovery to those areas that need it. You'd always like to go to the best area that you've got to start with. So you're going to have to destock a little more than maybe 20%. But everybody has a bottom 20% of their cow herd. And, Talking about my girls. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and, and within that 20%, you know, they're probably the ones that are costing you the money. They're the ones that, that, that usually are. But all that to be said is, you don't do it all at one time. You start with what you can manage well. And even when you begin the regenerative ranching, especially if you want to get into some of the more intensive grazing, work into it. You know, I get the question a lot of times, it says, well, how do I get going into this high stock density to where I can be grazing, you know, you know, 500 to a thousand, I mean, 500 to thousand to a million pounds per acre. Don't I need to be doing that? You know, this, this mob grazing. And I'll ask why? What evidence says that you need to do it? Well, isn't it just supposed to be better? Not necessarily. If you can't, you know, if you've never, if you can't identify what you're trying to address by doing that, because it takes a lot of forage to feed that many cattle. And you've got to allow not only for the forage for the livestock, you've got to have three times that for the organisms in the soil. So what does that look like? What are you really ready to do? So what I, you know, what I like to be able to do is just come back and say, look, you can't do it all. Let's do what we can. Let's start to set up with a good rest rotation and begin to monitor. And it's observation. See what you can really learn. Start with the areas that can respond the quickest. Because if you make a mistake, they also are more forgiving. They'll come back faster. But do it somewhere where you're going to be able to, to do it. And realize you don't have to do it all year long. Find an area that you really want to concentrate your soil health metrics around and do this regenerative type grazing and just do the best you can with it and the rest of it you're going to get to as you learn because once you start i don't think you want to stop that's where our guys on the ranches have been once we got started i can't i, I couldn't i couldn't make them go back to what we were there before okay let's that's the last question at the moment let's go back to this question of what do you mean by context 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 is what are the things you need to know about the region you live in? Uh, one of the things that's been amazing to me in all my years is that you, you talk about what the potential forage production for a range site might be. Let's say it's 3,000 pounds for an average year. Well, not every year is average. In fact, they're rarely average. You know, most of the time they're, they're favorable or unfavorable conditions that we have to deal with. And the differences between what a favorable year and an unfavorable year, a drought year versus a really wet year, it could be as much as half again as the production. So at 3,000 pounds in a drought, it may only be 1,500 pounds. In a really good year, it may be 4,500 pounds. How many people understand that context, that dynamic? And how many are willing to adjust their grazing management in order to address that? That's part of the context. What are the forages that need to be there? What were the, what was there originally? You know, how many people have ever gone back and looked at or try to find what the the, you know, the the early pioneers to these different regions that we live in now? What did what were the descriptions of this natural uh, flora that was out there? 
you know, I've, I've read of different accounts where the early explorers would get up on top of their saddles to stand on top of them to look across the prairie to see where they were going because the, the big blue stem seed heads were so tall. You know, that's the thing that we need to be able to understand. What was the original context, historical context? Not that we'll ever be able to do exactly that, but wouldn't it be neat, not neat to get pretty close? Be able to see what that would look like? That shows what the potential, the richness within the soil that had to be there in order for that to occur. And then what are the dynamics relative to weather patterns, to the different forages that are out there? What's the successional? You know, so one of the individuals asked about the, the succession, the plants from one state of transition to the next. What does that look like? Do you under, really understand it? Very few people, they, they just run cattle. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I mean by context. You, we've got to understand. We've got to understand a lot more than just how many cattle we think the place is going to carry. Okay. Um, we had a kind of a broad question toward the end, which had to do with how does regenerative ranching benefit the land, the land steward, animal life, wild and non, and I added the planet. Uh, you can narrow that down if you need to. Yes. Okay. Well, let's just take it one thing again. You know, regenerative rent, as we look at the benefits to the land and land stewardship, you know, the thing that we, we understand probably the best about the land stewardship is that we're looking at the whole system. You know, it, it, we're not just focusing on what's, you know, how many cattle can we run? You know, we're, we're looking at taking into consideration, you know, the, the, the people the animals, the wildlife, the land, the soil. So we begin to look at the entire operation. It's not just about the land in itself. You know, if we're not looking at all of it and take that into context of what our cause and effect is, we're probably gonna miss a point. Animal life, the more diversity, the more production through diversity that we can achieve, the more wildlife, more native fauna that we're gonna have out there to begin with. You know, the butterflies, you know, we, you know, I, I spent years, people wanted to get rid of milkweed. Yeah, you know, they don't occupy, but just a little bitty old spot, just about like that. You know, it's, it's nothing. And we're, yeah, we're going to worry about it. And then think of the benefits that it's doing below the soul, because we've never looked below it. You know, we've got to be able to go out there. And if you're, if you're curious, that's where you dig your, you take your shovel, dig up some of those old plants that you worried about. And you're going to see this beautiful uh, set a root system that just holds the soil. You got soil aggregation out there because you've got organisms within the within the uh, the soil that's working in 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 conjunction with the plant roots to where they've got the synergistic effect in there, and they're actually beginning to to develop the aggregation that occurs naturally around those root systems. You don't find that in a Bermuda grass stand very much. You know, you'll find it in native a whole lot more. But you, but you look at, we'll see, we'll see what's there. So it's the other organisms that contribute as well. You know, you, you, know, you think about, th you know, we think about uh, the more diversity of plants we have, some of those plants contribute to specific organisms within our plant, within our ecosystem. So if they're absent, some of these can't be there. Now, if they're a generalist, okay, they can tolerate lots of, lots of different ones, but the specialist, that's the ones we're really trying to find. When you begin to see some of these specialist species appear because of the organisms and plants that you have out there, we're probably beginning to get the diversity that we're looking for. So that's what we're really trying to find with this regenerative ranching is to build that expression of diversity without there that we're beginning to see a lot of these, these specialist type organisms present. You know your soil health is really beginning to improve when they're present. And then the planet. You know, uh, you know, we got, let's show that slide, 654 million acres of grazing lands, of which most are degraded to some extent. So if we can just take and improve our organic matters within our grazing lands across the United States, 1%, our methane issues are, you know, are basically neutral. And we, that's all it would take, you know, so we, you look at the you know carbon carbon dioxide that, that's being put into the air. You've got you know if you look at the different economic sectors, you've got energy, you've got transportation, you've got elect, uh, electricity, uh, you got 
the, you know, our, our houses, our commercial residents, and then you've got agriculture. They're, they're the economic sectors. Agriculture is only 11%. Of the grazing lands that we're looking at, it's only on 3% of the entire land. If we can go ahead and improve these, gra these grazing lands, 1% organic matter. You know, it'd be wonderful if we get more than that, but just 1%, we can begin to offset all this carbon that these other industries will never, you know, will never offset. And I don't see very many of us willing to cut back on our electricity, our transportation, or some of these, these luxuries that we have in this part of the part of the part of the country. It's going to be our improvements in our grazing lands that are going to allow us to 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 affect the planet positively and hopefully we can. Uh, help other countries do the same thing. Wow, you, you even got around to getting the planet involved. <laughs> that was a great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's um, five after the hour. Um, we don't have any more questions at the moment. We have a uh, comment from Becky that supports what you were talking about, the uh, carbon sequestration in the soil. And she mentions a movie, Becky, you didn't put the name of the movie in there, but if you want to, I'll, we'll share it afterwards. Um, so I had, we had, a, we had a moment where we tried, or I tried probably to be very specific about first steps, measure the soil, add what it needs Isn't and it? let's let it rest. Okay. So what, what the next, what would that next step be if, you think you have too few cows. Say you have a 200 acre pasture and you have 10 cows and it's starting to do pretty well. Okay, where do you go from there? Where do you go from there? Well, you know, the, the first step that I'd go with say you is ask you, are you proud of the calves that you're producing? And most people will say, yes, I spent good money on the bull. I've got a pretty good a herd health program. I've got a pretty good nutrition program. You know, I'd love to make more off the off the off the calves that I'm producing. So, if they're not carrying those calves to heavier weights, I'd say keep them after weaning and carry them on up to 800, 900 pounds that following spring on that next year's grass. If you can afford, if you can afford, if you don't need the income right then and can delay it, you can. I, we've had a program here for a number of years where we would help producers go in and they'd have to destock a little bit probably, get the pasture program going. And then when they begin to have the extra grass, then what we would do is, is let's have a retained ownership program where you keep those calves after weaning 60 days at least and then carry them on out, you know, if, if you can through the spring or as many as you can to as heavy as weight as, as you can go, you know, usually up to, you know, maybe a thousand pounds before you sell them. The return, you know, the way I look at it, you know, you've got the return to the cow, which is the value of the calf at weaning. And then you've got the stalker phase, which is the value of that calf through that growing phase. I can make two to three times more money on that calf during that growing phase than I can to return back to the cow coming off the, I mean, that calf coming off the cow. So you can double, triple your, your income, your revenue, net revenue back to your operation just by keeping your own calves back if you've got the grass. But if you don't have the grass, yeah. So that's to be the first place that you've got. Now, if you don't have cattle and you're trying to get someone to come in there, it's if you could work it out with a neighbor to say, look, <clears throat> I'd like for you to be in here for a certain period of time. I'll tell you when I want them in and I'll tell you when I want them out. And work it out to where either you're getting paid so much per head per day. And typically that ought to be in today's value somewhere about 75 cents to a dollar per cow per day. Okay. So <clears throat> let them have it for the period of time. And when you want them off, you get them off. You don't have to own anything, but you got your income. Now, you, you know, you may have to work with your, with your neighbor to see if that's something, that, arrangement that he would work. But you can 
but you can be assured most most of your neighbors probably need that extra grass. You know what they said? They said Mr. Bob Stevens, the owner of Geek Squad, really liked really liked our well, whatever we're doing here. Well, you know, we got the Geek Squad for a whole year free, and boy, do I need it! I was ready to throw this thing out of the window last yesterday. Free is a good price. Well, it is. So but I, you know, I, I couldn't think. I it's almost can, can, yeah. can you can you just disappeared in a disappear those people? If I can figure out which ones they are. They disappeared themselves. Wow. Um, yeah, sorry. Geek Squad. I, I, I was trying to follow it for a moment, and then I realized it, it couldn't be done. Um, I think we've been through our list of questions to you. You, you were very nice. You provided those uh, reference materials and where to go for more information in your slide at the beginning. Um, uh, I have no more questions. I don't have any more questions in the chat. Is there a thought you'd like to leave us with? Uh, yes, ma'am. And you know the thing that we, you know we talk about the uh, uh, regenerative ranching and carbon sequestration and things like that. But you know the the biggest thing, the biggest benefit I think is going to be to the planet is the water, water quantity and water quality. You know we've got to be sure that we get water that's going into the soil instead of running off. And the only way that it runs into the soil is where we have an organic enough organic matter to trap it into the soil and hold it. <clears throat> So that's the other benefit of, of, of the regenerative ranching is making sure that we not only do we have the ability to, to capture the rainfall, which is, you know, all of a sudden affected versus having rainfall that runs off. Yeah, you like to have to like to fill your ponds, but if you get enough water cycling occurring over time, what you find is that those ponds will begin to fill themselves because the water profile is being held within the soil, but you, it takes you know it takes a lot of organic matter to do that. So apparently, my threat to end the discussion provoked a few more questions, <laughs> and I'd like to ask Mary if you'll unmute yourself and you can ask yours first. You you've been quiet this whole thing, so if you'd like to ask your question, please go ahead. Mary Curry. Oh, well, Mary's, there you uh, go. No, this is Suzanne. I don't see a question from Mary. I see Jean and I see Kelly. Oh, okay. So let's go with Jean's question, which is, can you improve a prairie without grazing? You know, I'm a grazing guy, so I, I want to say no. But <laughs> the, the reality of it is that's, it's not not necessarily true. Depending on where you're at, you know, you you, you look at the roadsides that area between your, your your fence and the and the roads. You know, typically they look better than what you see across the fence. And what what are you doing? They're, they're just mowing, but you're going to have to at least mow it occasionally. You may have to have an occasional fire. You know, a lot of these uh, uh, native prairie areas. You know, as long as there is something that can refresh the 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 the, the, the say the stagnant forage every once in a while, it makes a big difference on what can occur as far as range improvement. Otherwise, it'd be, you know, if these plants get still, they begin to oxidize, you know, you're not getting the, the, the turnover, it's hard to keep it healthy in the long term. So there's got to be some way to, to have that turnover. You know, it's back to the, you know, the ecosystem, ecosystem functions. You know, you get water cycle, mineral cycle, or, or nutrient cycle, the energy cycle, and community dynamics. You've got to make sure that you're still allowing all four of those to occur. Thank you. And it, the question, the other question was from Kelly Crawford. I'm sorry, my eyes caught the MC above it. And MC to me is Mary Curry, but Kelly, if you have a question, you can please go ahead. And everyone, yeah. know everybody's name. Enjoy reception here at Hillside. Oh, our friends are back. Or... I don't know how to find them. Okay. Go ahead, Kelly. So she's put it in the chat and it is how to tell the county appraiser that I need more land per animal. That's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, well, Kelly, the county appraiser, <clears throat> 
is, is not always our, our easiest person to work with in our part of the country either. The, you know what, you know, they're, they're following the rules. They've got certain regulations that say you got to have so many that are there that uh, you so many animals to, to acquire an exemption. We've, some of our wildlife guys have actually worked where people have actually achieved a wildlife exemption on some of their smaller acreage lands because they're, uh, uh, you know, they, they just know that they're, they just don't have enough land to, to you know, to carry very many livestock at any given time. So the land appraisals, people, they typically don't understand our, I'd hate to say it, but our, our ecosystems, they don't certainly don't understand, don't understand forage production, the needs for, of livestock. And I, I don't really have a good solution as to how to, how to, to help them better understand what's really needed. But they're, because all they are, are looking for taxes. That's it. And, and it turns out that Mary does have a question and she wants to know how often do you mow? On our lands, we try not to mow any more than absolutely necessary. And it's usually following behind the grazing on areas that we want to reset, especially if we've got a lot of wolf plants, or I call wolfy type plants. You know, they get up there, they get old, decadent, and and nothing's trying to graze them. We'll go in there and we'll try to mow those to reset them uh, following the grazing event. And I don't like doing it more than, you know, during the growing season, I'll do it maybe, you know, I'd, maybe once. And I really don't like doing it any more than that. And, and it's really about timing. You know, if you look at what happens along the roadsides on the mowing, they do it twice a year around here for the most part. You know, and, and that can work pretty good, but in a drier climate, you get down there, and, you know, southwest, Texas, they, you know, once a year is going to be plenty and only if you've got residual to knock down. You, know, you don't want to be mowing if there's nothing there. So it, it sort of depends on the situation, but I'd say, you know, if you didn't have to, uh, I wouldn't. But if you have a need, a little spot mowing from here to, from time to time uh, would be fine. Or if you don't have any type of grazing and you just need to mow it, mow it once a year. And the timing that I would do it would be uh, after the spring green up. You know, you know, I'd like to top it early in the growing season, and I don't mean sh mow it short, I mean top it, and then let it recover, because what happens if we do it early in the spring, and I'm, the spring for your warm season plants, oh, is excuse number me, one. Chris, wait, number two, Chris, number three, they said they, it would take, they, no, you're number two, no, Chris, Chris, they said it would this take guy, a miracle sorry. to bring <laughs> back manufacturing, I brought back 700,000 jobs, they brought back Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, uh, so what, where was I there? <laughs> uh, About mowing and how yeah. you want to do it in the spring for your warm season grasses and how much to take off. Yeah, how, you know, if we're going to mow it in the spring, we, when we want to do it, it's going to be probably about the first part of June because if we hit those warm season plants early and we top them, what it's signaling to the plant is that Now's the time I need to get more plants. So it starts to tiller. So we take that top growth, it encourages the plant to have more tillers from the, from the base. And so then you have more total plants overall. And you want to do it, you know, while you've got good moisture conditions and about four weeks prior to the, to the, what I call the summer equinox. Because a lot of those warm season plants, are, you know, tall, tall grasses in particular, they're going to go reproductive, you know, soon thereafter. So that's what I'm trying to do. You know, so end of May, first of June, be able to top it at a high level, still, still, you know, when I've got good moisture, and that'll stimulate. If I don't have good moisture, I don't mow. Okay. The only thing left in the chat is a number of comments along the lines of what a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. We really appreciate the time you spent with us and all the information that you've shared. Well, I appreciate it very much. And Mary is asking about you, do I think you just do on part of the land? Yeah, just do it on the part of the land that needs it when it comes to mowing. Just do, do it, you know, it doesn't have to do the whole thing. You know, we, we think we got to do it all whenever we do do something but just those areas that need. <laughs> so, uh, for some reason we get that other one, but I've knocked it off again, so.
Okay. Um, I think we have covered our notes and all the questions. Well, Thank you again. It's been fun, been really enjoyable. Uh, if there's anything I can do, you can contact me. Uh, I'm the only Algil at noble.org, so you can find me pretty easy. <laughs> all Thank right, you. we'll be able to find you. Yeah, you guys unmute if you want to. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure. All righty, I'm going to end the recording. Y'all have a nice evening. Good night. All right. Bye.